So let's go to Romans chapter 6. All right, if you have your Bible or you have your device, we can start out there. and We'll put it up here in just a minute. Um, we're going to go to Romans chapter 6, and we need to understand that uh, exactly what baptism is, where it started, what it means, what happens when you're baptized. Is it more than just going in the water and coming back up? What is it all about? What is baptism all about? So Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 4, I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Uh, the scripture says this. It says, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So right off the bat here in the New Testament, we see that water baptism is really emblematic or sim uh, symbolic of us joining Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. His death, burial, and resurrection. And we must understand this as well. Please understand this. Water baptism is a part of God's full provision for the salvation of mankind. Water baptism does not get you into heaven. Water baptism does not save you. The water doesn't even really cleanse you. I think you need a little soap to go with it, but it might clear some stuff off of you. But, but water baptism is symbolic, but it's part of God's full provision. And there can be no full revelation of Jesus Christ without biblical water baptism. What I'm telling you this morning is from the Bible. That's why I'm, I'm going through a lot of scripture this morning. This is not how I feel. It's not my take on water baptism. I'm only giving you what the scripture says. OK. Over in John uh, 1 31, John said this. He said, I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. I did not know him. It's talking about Jesus. I didn't know him. But that he should be revealed. Jesus has to be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. This speaks to getting a full revelation of Jesus. This is why, uh, and I'm going to go into this next week as we begin this series on the name of Jesus. This is why you can't get upset with people who uh, have not been born again, if you will, saved, um, and, you know, or have a revelation of Jesus, who say, well, what was so special about Jesus? I mean, he was a man. I believe he lived. He was a prophet. He died for his people. But a lot of people died. A lot of leaders died. A lot of people were, um, you know, it, were uh, people who gave their life uh, for their followers. You know, what's so special about him? You can't understand it. You can't understand it unless it's revealed to you. Unless it's revealed to you. And part of that revelation comes through and with water baptism. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. Now, at his own baptism, Jesus said that being water baptized was necessary in Matthew 3.15 to fulfill all righteousness. In Matthew 3.15, Jesus said it is necessary to fulfill all righteousness, all righteousness. The only way that all righteousness is going to be fulfilled is that water baptism is a part of the salvation process. Amen. We have to know that Jesus himself was baptized over in Matthew 3. Jesus and his disciples baptized believers over in John chapter 3. Peter preached baptism in Acts 2.38. We'll get to that. Paul was also baptized in Acts chapter 9. And Paul taught water baptism in several scriptures. So baptism, water baptism, biblical water baptism is important. It's important. It's not a suggestion from Jesus. 
It's not something, well, you, you know, you can, you know, there's several things you can do. You can get saved. And I mean, if you want to get baptized, go ahead and do that. If not, don't worry about it. Jesus is not saying that. He's saying, get baptized. Get baptized. Now, remember, I'm balancing this with this is not what gets you into heaven. I fully believe that if someone, that people use this scenario very often, if someone is, gets hit by a truck or, you know, come down with something and they're on their deathbed and uh, they hadn't known the Lord and they give their life to the Lord, they confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and they believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead on the third day, that they will be saved, that they will get into heaven. Water baptism is not a vehicle to get you into heaven, but it's to give you a full revelation of Jesus while you're here on the earth. He'll give that to you when you get to heaven. When you get there, he, he'll, he'll give you a full revelation of himself. But if we want a full revelation of him now, water baptism is part of that process. On the day of Pentecost, a crowd convicted of sin that they committed, desiring to repent, they asked Peter, what shall we do to be saved? Remember that? After the Holy Spirit fell, Peter came out and he said, men and brethren, and he, he began to give uh, a sermon and he began to, the words that he uh, preached began to convict them and it, and, and, it, and it penetrated their heart. And they said, what shall we do? What are we supposed to do now? And Peter looked at them and he said, Every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 2.38. Indicating once again the importance of water baptism in establishing a right relationship with God. It's important to us to establish a right relationship with God. So this is some foundational stuff. So, so what does it actually do? Some of this stuff maybe you've heard before, but I believe for some of us, there will be some new revelation here. What does baptism actually do? What, what does it do? What, why does God have a purpose for it? Well, water baptism actually has its roots in the Old Testament, believe it or not. It actually has its roots in the Old, in the Old Testament. One thing that water baptism does for you, if you want to jot this down or maybe you can remember it, is you're given a new name. Let me explain. You're given a new name. And to fully understand this whole thing, we must understand the Old Testament practices that God established. OK, the first thing we have to understand is that God established relationship with his people based on what? Covenant. Covenant is an important word in water baptism. Back in Genesis 15, 18, uh, the Bible says, In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. He made a covenant with Abram. That's in Genesis 15, 18. And as a result of this covenant relationship, God did certain things immediately. Okay? All right? He changed Abram and Sarai's name. Now, this is important. This is important. All right. He changed their name. Go over to Genesis chapter 17, if you would, if you want to. Genesis chapter 17. And if you look at verse four of Genesis chapter 17, the Bible reads this way. It says, as for me, behold, this is God speaking. My covenant is with you and you shall be the father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Okay, drop down to verse 15, right there in, in, in chapter 17. This is all part of it. In verse 15, the Bible says, Then God said to Abraham, he's changed his name, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah, her name shall be. So do you see what he did with both Abram and Sarai? What he did was he added an A-H. Abram, Abraham. Sarai, 
Sarah. Change their name. Note that God included the A-H in both their names, which is a form of his own name. I told you I had a lot of scripture over in Psalm 68. Psalm 68. See, I know you guys, uh, you know, we, we talked about these young people with all these devices and, and social media and all that. Now it comes in handy, doesn't it? When somebody like me goes through 27 scriptures, you can get there quickly. Psalm, Psalm 68, 4 uh, you know, the God Almighty gave his name to those people who were in covenant relationship with him. And God re never, never referred to them as Abraham and Sarai again. Never referred to them as that again. You read in, in Psalms, do we have Psalm 68 for? All right. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah. And rejoice before him. In your King James Version, I'm reading from the New King James, there's a J-A-H. Now, I won't go too deeply into that. Um, you know, we have folks here who could explain the Hebrew. And I'm sure at some point, maybe we will get that going again uh, much more. But we know that that A-H part of it, God it was part of God's name. And he gave his name to Sarai and Abram. Sarah and Abraham based on covenant. My covenant is with you. And based on my covenant, I'm giving you my name. You with me so far? He gave them his name based on covenant. They have his name now. All right. Now, God required circumcision of all the males in the Old Testament. You ever heard that before? It was a token. It was, it was an outward appearance of their covenant relationship with him. And on the very same day that God made his covenant with Abraham, he gave him a new name. And then Abraham was circumcised. Down in verse 24, verse 24 of 17. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So what happened here? God made a covenant with Abraham and Sarah. Based on that covenant, he gave them his name, and then immediately Abraham was circumcised as a token of the covenant. All this is important. You're saying, what does this have to do with water baptism? Well, we're going to see. We're going to see. And we must also understand that on the eighth day, uh, Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, and so started a pattern. To reject circumcision was to reject God's covenant and be completely cut off from God and his covenant people if you rejected circumcision. So you say, well, how do you know that? Well, because up in verse 13 of chapter 17, the Bible says he who was born in your house and he who was brought bought with your money must be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And this uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people for he has broken my covenant. Cut off because he's broken my covenant. God took this seriously. He took circumcision seriously. He took his covenant seriously. Since Abraham received his new name on the day of his circumcision, all male children now receive their names on the day of their circumcision. You receive your name into the family on the day of your circumcision. John the Baptist did over in Luke 1, 59 and 60. And Jesus did as well. Jesus himself did as well. See, John the Baptist here, on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. They're talking about John. And they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias, uh, but no, <laughs> she said, we're going to call him John. His mother said, no, he shall be called John. So when he was circumcised, that's when he was given his name. Over in Luke 2.21, we see Jesus himself, Jesus himself was circumcised. Eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child. His name was called Jesus. And when eight days were completed, although they knew what his name would be, the angel already told him what they were going to name him. When eight days were complete, 
for the circumcision of the child. His name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So until he was circumcised, he wasn't given his name. He wasn't given his name. You know, a child was not the legal heir of their parents' property, nor were they part of the commonwealth of Israel until he was circumcised. God takes his covenant very, very seriously. And he insists that his people walk in it. After 400 years of slavery to the Egyptians, God delivered Israel from them because of his covenant. We find that over in Exodus chapter 2. He said, because of my covenant with you. He takes his covenant seriously. I'm going somewhere with this. Over in Exodus 4, 24, after the Lord sent Moses to Egypt to deliver the Israelites out of slavery, Moses almost lost his life, folks. Why? Because his son was not circumcised, which resulted in him not being in covenant with God. Came to pass that on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Keep it going. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet, saying, surely you are a husband of blood to me. She, Zipporah had to circumcise him. <laughs> so they let him go. She said, you are a husband of blood because of the what? Because of the what? Because of the what? Come on, y'all with me because of the what? Circumcision. Circumcision. God sought to kill Moses. Because his son wasn't circumcised, tell me he doesn't take it seriously. He takes it seriously. He takes it seriously. By the way, let me just throw this in here. You, I, I know also, because this is what I would be thinking. If I'm sitting here listening to somebody go through this baptism and they're starting in the Old Testament, I would say, yeah, you're talking about the Old Testament. Guess what, Brother Mike? We live in the New Testament. So, I mean, you're talking about all this stuff in the Old Testament. We live in the New Testament. Well, here's the thing about it. Uh, you know, the Old te Testament is what? It's the same thing as covenant, right? The Old Covenant. So there's an Old Covenant and there's a New Covenant. What's different about the Old Covenant and New Covenant are the two words, old and new. But what's same about it? Covenant. There's still a covenant. So we're going some. Just hang in there. There's still a covenant that's happening here, Okay. And so Joshua chapter 5, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, God didn't permit his people to enter into the promised land until they were circumcised to be in proper covenant. Why? Because the, 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 the folks who were older, who died in the wilderness, they were circumcised back in Egypt. But all the people who were born in the wilderness, they were not circumcised yet. So here they are uh, at, on the edge of getting ready to go take the promised land. That he promised them. The Bible says at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourselves and circumcise the son, sons of Israel again the second time. Let's do a circumcision before we go over here to take the promised land. This caused a delay in their inheritance because they weren't circumcised. They weren't circumcised. Being in proper covenant relationship with God always precedes receiving his inheritance. Throughout the Old Testament, the prophets spoke of a new testament. They spoke of a new covenant, which was to come. Moses spoke about it in Deuteronomy 36. He talked about the new covenant. Jeremiah prophesied about it over in Jeremiah 31. He talked about the new covenant. And then Ezekiel prophesied about a new covenant in Ezekiel 11. But he said there will be a new heart. Ezekiel 11, 19 to 20. God will give you a new heart. So I, I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. I will give them a new heart. A new covenant requires a new circumcision. Covenant is the same. Circumcision is the same. The only difference is old and new. Old and new. The circumcision of the new covenant is no longer natural circumcision of the flesh, but it is a spiritual circumcision of the heart. Look over in Deuteronomy chapter 10. No, I, I know there's a lot of scripture here. Don't worry. We're getting through it. 
Deuteronomy, I have, to, I have to do it though. I want you to see it in scripture, not because I don't want it to be, you know, well, this, this is Mike's take on baptism and, you know, uh, this is what he thinks about it. Because I have a lot of thoughts and I know you do too. <laughs> but we have to say, what does God say about it? What does God say about it? Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16 says, therefore, look at this now, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart. And be stiff-necked no longer. What is he telling the people? Take a knife and cut open your chest? I don't think that's what he's saying. Go over to chapter 30. Go over to chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. All right, we're going to see what he's talking about. Chapter 30. Look at, look at verse 6 in chapter 30. Verse 6 of chapter 30 of Deuteronomy says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart. So this is an, oper an internal operation that God is going to do with us. So then the circumcision of the foreskin of the flesh in the Old Testament was a type and shadow of what God would do spiritually in the New Testament. Still a covenant... But he wanted to show us physically what was taking place in the spirit later on. The circumcision. Circumcision of the flesh could not change the heart of mankind, humans. All of Israel's righteous rituals and ceremonial laws were only concerned with the outward appearance of man's conduct. All right. The attitude of the heart uh, didn't come into play here. They, they were intended to be examples and figures and illustrations of the ultimate type of human life that the spirit-led life that Jesus would then bring to us later on. For us to live our lives as Jesus did, a spiritual circumcision must take place that involves the heart and not the flesh. It's necessary. And because of this new covenant, this new testament, this new testament circumcision involves the heart, it's a spiritual nature. And because it's a spiritual nature, he was just doing, you know, people talk about, well, you know, this, this patriarch, uh, you know, patriarchal society. And it seems like God focused on men in the Old Testament, you know, and, 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 you know, and all of these things. And was he prejudiced against women? And, you know, God was using uh, men as an example. I would think, actually, I, I don't know if I'll get in trouble for this or not, but actually, I, I think you might be happy because I, I was in the Old Testament. I say, use the ladies to cut some stuff off. And then, you know, in the spirit, then we can do that in the New Testament. Uh, so the men had to take the brunt of it. it. Just look at it that way, ladies. God wasn't prejudiced against the ladies in the Old Testament. He's just using an example. He's using an example of what will happen in the New Testament, right? And because uh, th 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 this involves the heart in the New Testament, and it's a spiritual in nature. It's male and female. It's humans, Jew and Gentile. All of us enjoy the benefit of personal covenant relationship with God. Turn over to Galatians. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3. Let's take a look at this. Galatians chapter 3. Because what we want to do is we want to see what God was getting to. You know, a lot of times we take a moment in time and we point that out and we try to find all the things wrong with it and we try to build a doctrine and all of these things off of some moment in time. But that moment in time, God was just using in the Old Testament as an example of what he would do with everybody. OK, Galatians 3, starting at verse 27, says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Keep it going. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. You are all one in Christ. You know, I, I, um, I tell guys, uh, you know, all the time, you know, we, we're guys and we like to be macho and, you know, play sports and whatever it is that, you know, us guys like to do. And, uh, I, you know, I like to say, listen, you know, when it comes to Jesus, just understand that everybody's the bride of Christ, the bride. So you a bride too. <laughs> he be the man and we be the bride. <laughs> All right. It's spiritual. I mean, you know, uh, but, it's, but it's that way. So, um, you know, we're all one in Christ Jesus. All right. Another scripture. We're getting there. We're almost done. Romans chapter two. Romans chapter two. <laughs> all right. 
Romans chapter 2, all right, beginning at verse 28, all right, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision, circumcision is the point here, okay, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. So to be in covenant, thank you, so to be in covenant with God, it wasn't necessary to get circumcised outward in the flesh any longer in the New Testament. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. So now we see that this circumcision that God was giving us an example of in the Old Testament that he almost or sought to kill Moses for. And he wouldn't let uh, the Israelites get into the promised land without being circumcised. He's saying now with the new covenant, because that was an outward show of an inward change. Now you're, you're we're going to do something different. The circumcision is of the heart and not of the flesh like it was in the Old Testament. All right. Christians often su suppose that when they first repent and their sins are washed by the blood of Jesus, that they must automatically be circumcised in their heart. I'm just, you know, I, I gave my life to the Lord. I, I, I trust in you, Jesus. And now so automatically my heart is circumcised. But what does the Bible say about it? When does circumcision of the heart take place? Oh, now we get into it. Get into it now. Over to Colossians, go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. In verse 11, it says this. It says, in him, in him who? In him, Jesus. You were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body, the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Watch this now. Watch, 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 watch this, watch this. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. This is all the same thought. This is all the same thought in whom ye are all were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism. All right. In which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God. So then during it is during water baptism that an operation of God takes place. And this operation is circumcision of the heart spiritually. Never thought about that for baptism, did you? You said it's an outward show of an inward change. But actually, if I'm reading the Bible correctly, it says that an operation of God takes place. This circumcision of the heart. The believer's heart is circumcised during water baptism and is now in a new covenant relationship with God just as circumcision of the flesh put Israel in old covenant relationship with God. Water baptism and the ensuing circumcision of the heart puts us in a new covenant relationship with God through Christ Jesus. Let me go back and say water baptism does not get you into heaven. We're talking about living here on earth. By the way, can I just say that we're, you know, listen, uh, I love a, a good salvation message. We should have it every week, a good salvation message so people can get saved. But listen, when, when you're saved and when you're born, it's a beginning. You still living. I mean, if you want to get saved and then die, okay. <laughs> but if you want to live, because Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that more abundantly. Come on. Then we need to understand all of this. OK, you need to understand this, 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 this New Testament, uh, new covenant circumcision and relationship. See, children receive their father's name on the day of their circumcision, just as their natural identification. All right. With a name. OK, there's also a spiritual identification with any name. Any child in Israel that did not bear his father's name was considered illegitimate and therefore had no right to obtain the inheritance from anyone in Israel. Desiring for us to obtain an inheritance from God, Jesus, 
Jesus wants you to obtain. The inheritance is yours. Jesus commanded his disciples to baptize new believers. You know this one, Matthew 28, 19. You know it. You know it. Go, therefore, and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I just need just a couple more minutes here. All right. Let's examine the Bible to see how the apostles applied this great commission as they baptized. Let's look at that real quick, if you don't mind. Now, we read earlier Acts 2.38. First, let me read this again, Matthew 28, 19. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, when I baptized this morning, I don't know if you could hear or not, but when I baptized this morning, uh, I did one of, two, one of two things. Either I disobeyed what Jesus said here, or there's a revelation that God has given us in Scripture. Because I said, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So something is up here. Well, let's start with Acts 2.38 that we read earlier. What did, what did Peter say in Acts 2.38? Repent what? And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Peter, so I don't feel so bad now because if I disobeyed, Peter did too. But then Peter disobeyed several times, so maybe that's not a lot of clout. Okay, so I got to keep going. All right. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, look at this. Okay, I know, just a couple more minutes. Just a couple more minutes. Guess what? There's still some donuts out there too. Grab a donut on your way out, folks. Come on now. Y'all see, I already have one. Now, come on. All right. Acts, Acts 8, verse 12 says, But when they baptized, they believed Philip. He was baptized, and Philip was a disciple. Preaching, not one of the initial 12, uh, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and Women. All right, let's go over to verse 16 of Acts chapter 8. Verse 16. Verse 16 says, For yet he had fallen upon none of them. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Okay, I didn't read it all. Uh, he, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Flip over to Acts 19. This is, this is important. I know I keep saying that about everything, don't I? Acts 19. Look at Acts 19, verse 5. Acts 19, verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Man, it's a whole lot of people baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus when Jesus said, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hmm. Romans 6. Go over to Romans 6. Verse 3, Romans 6, verse 3, Paul said this to the Romans. He said, I do not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Even though Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, the only name the apostles ever baptized in was the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Many of you know it. Some of you don't. Some of you saying, where are you going with this? Well, were they being disobedient to Jesus or did they understand something very special? They understood that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not names. They're not names. They are titles. When my daughter calls me on the phone, if she says Father, she's not calling me by my name. She's calling me by my title. If you, if you say to me, pastor, you're not calling me by my name. And by the way, I, sh I'm, I know I don't really have time for this, but I'm already going now. So uh, by the way, <laughs> one, of, one, of, one of my pet peeves, and I don't have anything personal against people. I promise it's not personal. But one of my pet peeves is when I go to introduce myself to somebody and I say, hey, I'm, I'm Michael. I'm Michael Carter. How are you? And, and what is your name? And they say, my name is Dr. Johnson. I want to say, no, it is not. 
I understand you worked very hard to be a doctor. I understand it, baby doll. I, I do. But it is not your name. It's your title. It's what you do. But people take so much pride in that, and understandably so. Honestly, understandably so, because you do work very hard. People work hard to get, the, you know, to get to obtain things. So I, it's not, as, as I say, it's not personal, but it's a pet peeve that it's not your name. It's a title. It's a title. What is your name? What is your name? And so, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, th you know, there's one name. All right, now watch this. I don't even know if I have these up here or not. But uh, the name of the Father, all right? I think back at Exodus 13, 3. Do you have that? We have to go through this quickly. And, and Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you were, went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by the strength of the hand of the Lord brought you out of this place. Okay, so you can go over to Jeremiah 16, 21. Just want to take these Take you through this. Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know, I will cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. All right. One more. Go over to Amos. Uh, if I put that one up there, Amos chapter five, he made Pleiades and Orion. He turns the shadow of death in the morning, makes the day dark as night. He calls for the waters of the sea. He pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. The Lord is his name. So the name of the Father is the Lord. I feel like I don't have to prove this to you, but if you go over to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, I will prove to you that the name of the Son is Jesus. I feel like I don't really have to prove it, but maybe I do. And she, who? Mary, will bring forth a son, son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name of the Father is the Lord. The name of the Son is Jesus. And then we're talking about the Holy Spirit, the anointed one, is Christ. Christ comes from a Greek word, Christos, meaning the anointed one. The word is derived from a, a Greek verb meaning to anoint, right? In the Greek Septuagint, the, the word Christos was used to translate uh, to Hebrew, the Hebrew word for Messiah, meaning one who is anointed, anointed, the whole, and is anointed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is, was anointed. I should have wrote down that scripture. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. Do I have that? Yes. Thank you. Tegan, you are the man. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the Lord Jesus Christ. The name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said the name of, not in the names of, but the name of. That's why we baptize in the name of Jesus. Now, having said that, I'm not a condemner, and I hope you wouldn't condemn me. This is the revelation I have that I believe I showed through Scripture, okay? If you believe something different, we can still get together and have coffee and worship together, all right? Because it's not like you're saying Jesus didn't die on the cross. Now, if you say that, then we got an issue, okay? But, but as long as we got that established, we can talk about everything else, all right? But I'm just trying to show you through Scripture why we do what we do. It's a conviction that I have. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other name, right, whereby men must be saved. Philippians 2.9, we're going to talk about this next week, uh, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. The name of Jesus is important. Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do in word or, do, or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, which to me includes water baptism, right? It includes water baptism. One more thing. Well, two more things real quick. When should a believer be baptized? When should a believer be baptized? All right. Acts 2.38 talks about repentance. So as soon as repentance takes place, you, should, you can be baptized. You should be baptized then. Upon receiving the word gladly over in Acts 2.41, it says they received the word gladly and then they were baptized. So if you receive the word gladly, be baptized. If you have a believing heart, there's several scriptures for that where the, where the disciples or people had a believing heart and so they were baptized. 
When you have a good conscience toward God, 1 Peter 3.21 says when you have a conscience toward God, be baptized. So there's several instances when you have a revelation of who Jesus is, you're eligible to be baptized. It's time to get baptized. And guess what? If that happened 20 years ago, you can get baptized today. There's no statute of limitations on baptism. It doesn't run out. You don't have to start over, okay? No statute of limitations. What about, real quick, what about infants? What about infants, all right? Infants have not, so I just talked about the instances of getting baptized, right? So it's when, you, when repentance takes place, when you receive the word gladly, when you have a believing heart, and when you have a good conscience toward God. All of those are scripture. I, I, Acts 2.38, if you want to write them down, Acts 2.38, Acts 2.41, and then Acts chapter 8, really pretty much a, a big part of that whole chapter, talks about having a believing heart. 1 Peter 3.21 talks about a good conscience toward God. These are the instances that people got baptized, not when you were an infant. Because it's impossible for them to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are they cursed? I don't believe they're cursed, right? I mean, I'm not saying you, you, you know, you're cursed and you can't come to church and all of those things. I'm just, my point is, listen, I believe personally when you have a conscience toward God earlier, even if you were baptized as an infant, you need to get baptized again in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then uh, <laughs> sprinkling, golly, sprinkling or pouring water over parts of the body, it's the reason why I don't believe it's the same is because really of what the word baptism. The, the word baptism comes from a Greek word, baptismo or baptizo, that means literally is defined, it means to bury. Now remember we read, we started off with Romans uh, 6, 4 that said you are buried with him in baptism. So if it's an outward show, if it's an example, you must be buried. So that's what I believe in going down in the water based on the Bible. And the word baptism means to be buried. We identify with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. And you're, you can't be resurrected if you're just sprinkled, okay? Now, again, if you get sprinkled upon, if there's parts of your body that water's poured upon, I don't believe you're cursed. And, you know, if you go into church, you're going to start burning or whatever, you know, people, things people might come up with. I'm just saying that there was a case where people were baptized in John's baptism in Acts chapter 18, and they were rebaptized. They were rebaptized correctly. Okay. So there is precedence for that. Amen. So what we find is that baptism, I know people are happy right now. What we find is that baptism is, um, uh, it's important to God, but there's so much more to it than just, oh, we're going to have a little baptism service. Uh, you know, people go down and come up and then that's it. There's so much more to it. You, you get a name, you get the name of God when you're baptized, thereby giving you greater revelation. Not that you can't live a good life. You can, you can live a good life, but I'm talking about living the best life. Right. And so you get a greater revelation of God. All right. You're circumcised of the heart. Right. You're officially part of the family because you have the name. OK. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are pedigree now. You are pedigree. Right. And it's not because of anything you've done. It's just because of your name. So all those people that you talk about, well, the Rockefellers or the Trumps or the whoever, you know, just because of their name. Guess what? You're the same way <laughs> because you have the name of the Lord. You're part of it you, because you have his name. Amen. And so that is the purpose of baptism. And there's always, there's always opportunity, always opportunity for baptism. There's no condemnation in it at all. No condemnation, okay? I'm just saying that there is opportunity, and if you if you haven't been baptized in your life, then I'm saying that God is calling you to be baptized. He's saying, do it because I want to be closer to you. I want to give you my name, and these are the reasons why. Amen.